This morning we begin session, or continue in session two of It's All About Relationship. And you know that session two is all about God's new covenant of love and grace through Jesus Christ. And as we'll see, within every covenant, uh, there are parties, there are terms, there are promises, there are consequences. We may not think of the gospel as a covenant, but that's exactly what it is. It's the covenant relationship that we have with God, with Jesus Christ being the bridge or the mediator. Now, uh, this, this last uh, few days, so, several of us went down to Kentucky and uh, visited the Creation Museum and Noah's Ark. Uh, let me tell you, if you haven't visited Noah's Ark, which is just south of Cincinnati, the life-size replica of Noah's Ark, you need to put that on your bucket list. For some of you who are traveling down to, say, Florida, uh, on, you know, for winter or whatever, uh, it's just right off the interstate. It's like five minutes off of the interstate, about 30 miles or so south of Cincinnati. But anyway, what struck me about Noah's Ark, other than the, just the, the size of it, and the fact that Noah didn't have any power tools, right, was just the fact that in this massive ark, there was just one door. And God closed that door when Noah and his family, eight in all, had entered the ark along with all the animals. Who is our door today? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus says, I'm the door. As important, why is it that important that we talk about covenants when we're talking about our faith in Jesus Christ? We began last week talking about the old covenant. And certainly Noah was one of those covenants, the covenant that God made with Noah. It's so important that people understand that the gospel is really a new covenant and it was sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we, as we think about this session two of covenants, I want to remind us of something else. And that is that we have a part in this. When we talk about covenants, you may not see yourself in the midst of all of that, but let me try to change that a little bit this morning. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Talking again about Jesus. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. What word jumped out at you in these verses that I just read? What word was it? Reconciled and reconciliation. In fact, uh, Paul said that we are uh, ministers of reconciliation and that we preach a message of reconciliation. In fact, he goes on to say, we are Christ's what? ambassadors that's right remember last week we talked about going into every encounter and every relationship with what an agenda right an agenda and that's because we are Christ's ambassadors and because we have a ministry and a message of reconciliation what a precious precious message now is this ministry and this message is it of men or of God? Yeah, the fact that we're His ambassadors means that this is from God and through God. 
And so when we're, when we're sharing the gospel, when we're doing what we're called to do, is it of human origin or is it of divine origin? It's of divine origin. Listen to what uh, Coleman writes in the Master Plan of Evangelism. He writes, and this is talking about the first century church, evangelism was not interpreted as a human undertaking, but as a divine project that has been going on from the beginning and would continue until God's purpose was fulfilled. It was altogether the Spirit's work. So, brothers and sisters, when we're sharing the gospel, we need to understand that we're doing a divine work. It's the message and the ministry of reconciliation that God has given us to share with others. Uh, we are... Uh, well, let me share with you. You, 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 can't, you can't share the good news of Jesus Christ and uh, not... Be Christ's ambassador. You have, you have to be. They go hand in hand. Uh, on the way down, and I, I'm not going to say any names. I don't want to embarrass them. But um, one of uh, as we were going down to Cincinnati or coming back, uh, uh, one of our one of the folks in our van shared a story of when they go into a restaurant. They ask the the waiter or the waitress, "Is there anything we can pray for you about?" And it just so happened they were in one, and the fellow said. Uh, I'm, uh, yes, there is something you could pray for me about. I, my wife and I are divorced, and I'm really, pray, I, I'm really hoping that this summer I could spend some time with my son. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'd like you to pray that my wife and maybe the judge will be favorable to me being able to spend some time with my son this summer. They said, we'll pray for you. And they did. A few weeks later, they're in the restaurant, and uh, the waiter saw them, came running over with tears in his eyes and thanked them for praying for him. That's exactly what we're talking about. That opens the door for opportunities to be that minister of reconciliation, that ambassador of Jesus Christ. It's something that every one of us uh, should be doing. And so let's, let's pray this morning that as we think about what it means to share, it's all about relationship, that God will help us to see who we really are in Christ. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ having been given a ministry of reconciliation. All right, let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you that you've endowed us You've uh, ordained us as your ambassadors. And Father, help us to go into every encounter uh, that we have this week as uh, with an agenda, and that is to share your love with those who may not know it. Help us to be faithful. Uh, Father, we know that you're going to work through us and in us as we do this. So uh, we thank you for that. We have confidence in knowing that uh, we have this message and it's from you. So thank you for this privilege. Uh, bless our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, open up your books. Uh, that is your, your, your books that have the drill on the front. Those books. Open them up to page six. And you're going to get with a partner this morning and look at those 20 things that are listed and pick the ones, maybe the top two or three, that you feel are most important. Everybody uh, has an idea of what they want, how the church could grow. Uh, so it was uh, actually, let me see, um, my wife picked out number seven and said if the church had a more effective preacher, the church would grow this morning, just so you know. So if you pick that one, you're, you're not alone. My wife did too. And I said, well, Mark, yeah, thank you. Uh, anyway, I want you to look down that list of 20 things and pick what you feel is most important, most effective in causing the church to grow. Talk about that with your partner. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Look down that list, maybe circle the ones 
that you think are the most important? All right. Uh, go ahead and shout out the ones that you think are most important. We're talking about the most important things uh, to contribute to church growth. Number two. Number, number what I hear? Eight? Two. I heard number, wait a minute, I heard number eight. Uh, spend more time in prayer. How many of you would agree with that? That's certainly important. Uh, how many of you pray with your eyes open? Especially when you're driving? Yes, that's good. Uh, you know, praying with our eyes open, what do you think that might mean? Yeah, God's with us all the time. And as we're praying for, uh, well, what Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Guess what? The person that uh, he might want in the kingdom is maybe the person waiting on us or the person that we're talking to. And so, which comes first, prayer or evangelism? Prayer. See, we would all say that. Uh, I'm going to reverse it. What? And I'm going to say that evangelism fuels prayer. If you've ever shared the gospel, then you know exactly what I mean. If, and if you've never shared the gospel, you're going to be quick to say, oh, prayer. But let me tell you, when you're sharing the gospel, you're praying like you've never prayed before. <laughs> I'm telling you, how many of you would agree with that? You're praying like you've never prayed before when you are sharing the gospel. And when we're looking to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you're praying. You're praying nonstop. You're praying with your eyes open. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, prayer is really important. Uh, and I believe that evangelism will actually fuel our prayers and really give passion uh, to our, our prayer life. Especially as we're praying for those that we love and we dearly want to see in the kingdom. Alright, what's another one? 20. 20. The very last one. Insist that leaders start and continue training as many of your members as possible to effectively share the gospel with those they know outside of the church who aren't attending now and probably aren't interested in coming to anything you are doing or offering. So you think that's important. How many of you think that would be important? Uh, I, I think that's probably what we're doing right now, training everybody to share their faith. But uh, yeah, uh, of all the things on here that would contribute to church growth, there's actually a church out in, in, in Arizona that the only statistic that they keep track of is how many times each week this ire is shared. And they can chart the church growth by the number of times this is shared during the week. That's the most important statistic. That's the number one statistic in their newsletter and in their bulletin every week is how many times in that week um, this was shared. And guess what? Their church is growing. Now, they have all the other things. They're doing all the other things. But uh, this takes precedent over, over all the other. Okay, good. What else? What other numbers? Number nine. Number nine. Not necessarily Re relocating, but maybe clearing the front of the church like we have in our plans right now. Oh, okay. So like re 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 uh, landscaping and remodeling the, the church building to make it, it, yeah. yeah, to bring it into the 21st century kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, we do have those plans for that. Very good. What other? Number three, start up new children, youth, or adult programs. Yeah, as new people come in, of course, they'll have needs. They'll have, uh, well, well they'll, bring, they'll bring kids and youth, and we need to have those in place. Many of these things we have done or are doing, aren't we? Uh, but those in and of themselves probably will not lead to church growth more than each one of us going out from here and being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Okay? Any others that really impressed you here? What's that? 13? Make better use of social media. Yes, that would come from one of our high schoolers. 
make better use of social media, websites, sermon, online, etc. Uh, we've tried really hard in the last couple of years to do some of that media and websites and our church app. I hope all of you have that church app. A uh, really cool tool to be able to use. But yeah, those are things that we got to do. We got to do better at too. One of the biggest tendencies ever had people outside the church was when we took an ad and said, Hey, we're going to tell them about the program ahead of time. Okay, yeah, like newspaper articles and stuff like that. Yeah, excellent. Okay, we've got to move on here, but these are all good things. But realize from this, probably the greatest impact that we can have as a church is when we're all out there seeing ourselves as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Okay, open up your other booklet now. The uh, It's all about relationship booklet. And we're going to turn to the page with the rocket ship on it. And you remember in the first session that we learned that man has a what? A what kind of problem? God had, or excuse me, man has a sin or a heart problem. Uh, we learned that and we realized that because of the heart problem, we have relationship problems. There are wars, there are all kinds of violence. In fact, some of us uh, don't even like watching the news anymore, do we? Because it seems like it's always, always negative. And it just goes back and reinforces the fact that man has a heart problem. And so session one was really kind of a, a discouraging. But the end of that basically said that God did for man what man was incapable of doing for himself, right? So that was the good news. It kind of ended on a good note. God has done for mankind what man could not do for themselves. Uh, not with money, not with more politicians, not with more police or social programs or whatever, God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. And then we began session two, and session two began with talking about what? Covenants. And it's a covenant of mercy, that's right. And we, we started in the Old Testament and we went through, and that's kind of what the rocket uh, the stages of the rocket kind of have to do with this is that uh, God uh, God is a God of covenants and we see these in the Old Testament and the covenant that I was reminded of this last week is the covenant that God had with Noah right I mean it's kind of hard uh, uh, to not notice that when you're, you're standing in front of a life size replica of Noah's ark but the fact that God is faithful in his covenants. And so that's what we looked at with the first nine minutes last week of, of it's all about relationship. And the way the, the reason why it's all about relationship is different than any other evangelistic tool that I've ever used is that it, it leads people down a path talking about uh, covenants. We don't understand covenants. We really don't. Uh, Christians don't understand them, and certainly those outside of the church don't understand uh, what covenants are about. But with covenants, you have parties, and you have terms, you have promises, you also have consequences. And so God established covenants with man, and it was all about uh, the new covenant then that we're going to get to today, is about that relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? So we're going to talk about that. So open up again to the page with the rockets, and we're going to listen to John Hindy talk about the new covenant, all right? And I want you to pay special attention to this, especially think about what we often don't share when we're talking to people about Christ that may be included in the, these uh, few minutes that we're going to watch today. Thank you, Gina. Died in the cross and he was raised from the grave. 
we're going to read this verse in, in the Hebrews. It's make, it's, the writer's making a comparison between the priests in the Old Covenant and Jesus in the New Covenant. This is interesting. It says, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. So God's got a new covenant for man here. That those who are called, he invites everybody, may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he died as a ransom to set them free from sins. So we can receive the, our, our eternal inheritance from God. Jesus paid the ransom. He paid the price, the debt, to free us. It also says in Matthew, this is my blood of the covenant, this is Jesus speaking, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He was the Lamb of God. He was the final sacrifice that is able to forgive all men of their sins. His covenant is better than the Jewish covenant. He's comparing the priests here. He says, but the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. It's found in better promises. So Jesus has a superior covenant, superior to the, the old covenant. He's a better mediator, and his covenant has better promises. Now as we move on, we come back to the issue of relationship. This is all about our relationship with God, our having a good relationship with Him. And in Matthew, we see Jesus giving all of us the greatest invitation anybody could ever give. And He's inviting you and He's inviting me. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And we all go through some times when life is really worrisome, it's burdensome, we get tired of it be frustrated but he says you know that's what I'm here for come to me I'll help you get through that stuff and he said I'll give you rest you know not just give us physical rest but emotional and spiritual rest because he takes all this negativity stuff away from us he deals with our sins he gives us hope he says take my yoke upon you and learn from me that is partner up with me and I'm going to help you. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. He's not a mean, vindictive God. He's gentle. He wants to treat us humbly. And you'll find rest for your souls. And that's where we really need the rest. Is in our souls inside. It changes everything. In Romans it says, I, I like two things it really says in here. Really, really good. It says, now we rejoice our wonderful new relationship with God. So if I accept what Jesus has done for me, I've got a wonderful new relationship with God. That's what he's offered me. That's what he's given me. All because of what Jesus has done for me, not what I've done for God. <clears throat> In dying for our sins, and I like this, making us friends of God. That's what God wants with us. He wants a family. He wants us to be his sons and daughters. He wants us to be friends with him. It's not about man-made religion and ceremonies and traditions and, and smoking pots and religious clothes and language. It's about a friendship. That's what God wants with us. He died for us. Now, after this new covenant, God has no need to give us another covenant. So there, since Jesus, there have been others that come along, some claiming to be prophets of God and, and gotten messages from angels. <coughs> The New Testament says you don't need any other message. Anybody else that comes offering something new, they're not from God. And we're going to see here, what more can you or anybody else promise me that God's not giving me that's really important? I like this last statement on the side. It says, long before you decided what you do with God, God decided what he'd do with you. I like that. So even before I ever acknowledged God or thought about God, God was already thinking about me. He laid out a plan and he carried it out. <clears throat> now the next page, second page of this study, uh, helps identify the parties, terms, and promises of the new covenant. So we ask the question, what does God really want from us and with us? And the answer is he wants the same thing he's wanted since the beginning. He, he wants a family united with him in love. We read that in this verse, it says, God decided in advance, that is before time, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. He wants a family. He doesn't want a bunch of religious weirdos. He wants a family. And that's what he, he's done all this for. So he wants us to have a healthy relationship with him and with others. 
it's not just to become religious and think we're saving ourselves through being religious. So we're going to look at the parties and the promises and the terms here. And we'll be done with this study. But the first part looks at the parties. Who's this covenant between? Well, as we read the New Testament, we find out this new covenant is between God and anyone who chooses into Christ. I like the way it's worded here. It's all about relationship. This covenant on God's part is offered to all people of any race, economic group, or nationality, to alcoholics, adulterers, addicts, murderers, immigrants, prisoners, failures, the successful, religious or not, presidents, men, women, old, young, good or bad. God wants to include everybody in his family. He wants to rescue everybody. But as it says here, it's an individual choice. Uh, God's not going to force anybody into this relationship that doesn't want to be a part of it. And nobody can choose for you. Your parents can't make this decision for you. Your grandparents can't. Your mate, uh, your preach, priest or your preacher, it's my choice. Uh, I read recently someplace that somebody said, God has no grandchildren. And what he meant by that is my parents can't make this decision for me. It's all first generation. It's my choice in the Christ. I like the way this one man stated at one time, sort of summary of this. He said, we're all oddballs. But God loves us anyway. <clears throat> and so for all of us who, some, of, some, some people like to think they're better than they are, but you know, if we get really honest, maybe we recognize we're odd in some different ways. We all, we all got our quirks and weird things. But God loves us anyway. What a great message the Bible tells us. So that's, that's who it's all, it's all for everybody. And Jesus said, come to me, and I'll give you a rest. Then the next section we looked at, at look at here, it says God's responsibilities to those who accept his new covenant. What are his promises? Well, there's a verse here at the top in Corinthians that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that if I accept Christ and I'm in Christ now, we'll explain that a little bit more later, he's a new creation. He's made new. The old is gone, the new has come. So what the Bible is saying there is that if I accept God's offer to restore my relationship with him, and I accept Christ, and I'm in Christ, in God's eyes, I'm a new person. Because I've been forgiven. I mean, everything it's like starting over. And we've made a list here of all the new things that are offered those who accept Christ and become Christians. I'm just going to skim down this list. I'm, I'm not even going to hit all of them, but I think we've got them all on here. We might have missed some, but I think we've got the, the major ones. And some of the new things that I have if I follow Christ, accept Christ, I have love like I've never had it before. Nobody's loved me enough to do what God's done for me. I'm free from accusation. I don't have to worry about after I die, I'm going to stand before God and He's going to bring up this whole long list of things I've done wrong. I'm forgiven. It says in Hebrews, God won't remember our sins. I'm glad. That is really good news. He's going to raise me from the grave someday. I'm going to have an eternal life, more than just being raised from the grave. Everyone's going to be raised from the grave, but those who are in Christ are going to be raised to eternal life. I'm going to have a place with God. I'm going to be with Him forever. No more death, no more tears, no more illness. I'll have life to the full. That doesn't mean I'm going to get rich, but in here, my soul, that's where Jesus promises us that in spite of whatever may go wrong for me in life, I've got Him in me. Because of that, I have joy. Because I don't, I know it doesn't matter what anybody does or what I may do. I'm going to be with God for eternity. I'm born again. I have a new birth. The Bible talks about. Jesus talked about that. I, I'm spiritually born again. It doesn't make me weird, uh, but it makes me part of God's son now. I'm adopted into his, in, into his family. I have a family. I have His presence, daily help. I have a new mind and attitude. It's being changed. I've got a new purpose in life. Citizenship in God's kingdom power to live for him. I have security that I can know that when I die I'm going to be with him. I don't have to live in fear of that not happening. Now, there's two interesting things near the bottom of this. One is a persecution. And we have to put that on here to be honest. Jesus said that those who are followers of Christ will be persecuted. Now, that doesn't mean every single person who becomes a Christian is going to be persecuted, but it's a real possibility. We see a lot of persecution of Christians going on in the world today. People being killed because of Christians. And so I need to know that could happen. It's part of the deal. 
There will be people who will hate me because I'm a Christian. But have you noticed there are people who hate those of other race because they're a different race? There are people who hate people because they're a different nationality or political power. There are people who hate people because they're the opposite sex and they use them, abuse them. Um, so persecution is not isolated just to being a Christian. But I need to understand there are people who will hate me because I'm a Christian. I may never encounter them in my life, but it's a possibility. <clears throat> Second, uh, next, the two down is suffering. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in Christ, that doesn't free me from suffering in life. I may experience suffering in my life. Almost all of us do. And so I just need to understand, we're going to talk about this in a second more. It might become a Christian is not a guarantee I won't suffer anymore. We'll talk about that. But I have hope. Loving discipline, the bond there, I'm God's child now. And when he sees me getting off track, he wants to discipline me for my own good. And he's promised he'll do that. He's got different ways. We'll talk about that in the last lesson. I have his understanding. He understands what's going on in me even when I don't. And I have accessibility and confidence. He's, he's there at 724. I can go to him. I can praise him. I can thank him. I can cry with him. You can ask him to hug me. He's available. Now, the little box up there is worth two lessons, but it's just to point out, in the New Covenant, God does not promise material wealth, health, and prosperity. There are those today uh, who are known for preaching what's called the prosperity gospel. Their message is, if you're faithful to God, and you're, you follow Him, and you're a Christian, everything's going to go great for you in life. You're going to get rich, and you're going to have good-looking kids, and they're going to have straight teeth. You'll never even need to put braces on them. Uh, you're never going to get sick. And the reverse is, if you don't get rich and you do get sick, there's something wrong in your life. That's just terrible teaching. That's not what the New Testament teaches. Uh, Jesus said this. Look at that verse there. It says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. He did. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So if the world throws the worst at me that it has, they persecute me, they, uh, they punish me, they ask me to recant my faith in Jesus or they're going to cut my head off. Let them cut my head off. Uh, I'll be with God. So if they do their worst, I get the best. But this idea, we're, we're going to all have troubles. We have family problems, we have health problems, we have job problems, we have government problems. Being a Christian doesn't free me, but God's going to be with me through all that stuff. And, well, it's not going to be forever. I'll be with Him forever. The next verse there says, Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in His promises, we can have real peace with Him because of what Jesus our Lord has done for us. So God makes me right with him, and then I'm at peace with him. The relationship's restored. Now man's responsibility, the last part of this, is what are the terms? If I accept this covenant and enter with him, what's God expect and ask of me? It's not that complicated to explain. There's two things. There's just two things he asked me to do. Now they're not easy, but there's two things he asked me to do. It says right here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's the first commandment God gave man. It's the greatest one, he says. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors yourself. Everything, everything written in the New Testament is designed to teach me how to do those two things. There's anything else written there that does anything other than teach me how to carry those two things out. How to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. And then I love my neighbors myself. So there's correction written in there to those who were not doing a good job in that. There's encouragement to do the right thing, how to help each other, how to love each other, how to stay close to God. And so our calling to God and our privilege is to love God and to accept His love and then to love others as He has loved us. That's what He's asked us to do. And it's not easy. But our model and how to do that is Jesus. And that's why I need to <coughs> excuse me, become more familiar with him and read the gospel so I really understand and just keep coming back over this. Look at how he loved people, even those who killed him. Jesus loved the good, the bad, the displaced, 
the arrogant, the religious, he loved everybody. Now, that doesn't mean he accepted everything they did, but he offered them love and a new life. And then this last verse, just the first part of it, says, for Christ's love compels us. Compels us. When we see what he's done, it moves us to love God and live our life out in gratitude, and it moves us to love others for him too. Now at the top of the next page, we're about done here. <clears throat> Two last verses we're going to read. The first one says this, having such great promises as, as these, as we look down that long list, all these things God promises us, let us turn away from everything wrong, whether of body or spirit, and purify ourselves, ourselves, living in the wholesome fear of God, giving ourselves to Him alone. When I understand what God's done for me and what He's promising, I just want to live for Him out of gratitude. Oh my goodness. And then it says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. And I like that phrase. He lavished on us. So see the guy sitting over there with a pile of gifts. When it talks about God lavishing us with His gifts, I can just picture myself seated here at my birthday or Christmas, and I've never had this happen to me. I've gotten more than my fair share of anything I ever deserved from others. But I, I'm just it's like gifts are piled up. All you can see is my face sticking out. And the, the gifts are just stacked up from family and friends bringing gifts in. That's lavishing me. And God's given us so much more than we need or deserve. We need it. We don't deserve it. But He loves us. Now, that long list of where to go here, of the new things that we have in our life in Christ on the previous page, all the verses there, what we've done, they're, they're all typed out here. I want to encourage you this week, while we wait for the next lesson, I want to encourage you to read, go back and read those promises yourself. See them firsthand. If you want to look them up in your own Bible, you can, but all the references are there, so you can't see that. And just see for yourself what God has promised us. I encourage you to do that. So this is the end of the second lesson, and uh, we'll come back next week for the third lesson and continue our way through these. Oh, it's all about relationship. All right. Talking about covenant. Now, I asked you to think about what you find is very odd about this session two. Uh, does anybody find session two as different than maybe any other gospel presentation that they've ever heard? Nobody? How many of us, when we're trying to lead somebody to Christ, has said, and oh, by the way, you could be persecuted for accepting Christ? How many of you have ever shared that? I know that uh, in sharing the gospel in Taiwan, it was an important part of the gospel presentation because it was very likely that they would be. But uh, how often here in America do we share that uh, by accepting Christ, you may be persecuted even by members of your own family. Or that you may suffer as a result of accepting Christ. Or that you may be disciplined. And uh, there will be more of that in the fourth session, how, that, how God may accomplish that. But we don't often share those things. We, we get them dunked in the baptistry and then we say, oh, by the way, uh, later on when something happens, this, we forgot to tell you that this could happen. What do you like about this section on covenant? What do you like about it? Yeah, go ahead, Vicki. Um, I like um, the part where um, it says that um, even though that we are oddballs, um, God loves us anyway. Yeah. I, I like that because um, I um, used to get used a lot because I was so different and I really didn't think that anyone else would love me, but seeing that, it could have made me feel a whole lot better about Thank you for sharing that, Becky. Becky was saying that, I uh, hope you heard her, that, uh, you know, God loves even oddballs. And uh, we all have our oddities. 
But you know what? God loves us. And you know, when I shared this uh, a few weeks ago with my neighbor John, uh, my neighbor John, look at John, it's not, uh, my neighbor Dave, uh, another David, but when I shared this with my neighbor David, he, uh, this is the section that really affected him the most. To know that God would love him, even, he didn't even think that was possible, that God might love him. And so to see all the things, the blessings that we receive from God as a result of, of God's love for us is really impactful, really powerful. Now, what benefit do you think it would be to say to them, uh, all these scriptures, by the way, are given for you here, and that I'd like you over the next week to read through these. What do you think that does? How important do you think that is? It shows that it's right in the scripture. It's not just something you're presenting. Right. It shows that it's right there in the scripture. Uh, we didn't just make this up. It's in God's word. Yes? Mm -hmm. What are we trusting that the Lord's going to do through the word? Convict. Keep his promises. Uh, the, the Bible is the inspired word of God, is it not? It's God breathed uh, through the Holy Spirit. And we're expecting that the Holy Spirit is going to be working through the Word and in the heart of the person that we're sharing with as they read through these. And that, that the Word of God convicts and convinces. And it can soften the hardest heart. And so allowing uh, opportunity for that is really important and it's respectful. And so as we give people time to reflect on God's word, especially when we're talking about covenants, uh, it's, it's so important. Another thing that it illustrates, which we don't get to here uh, in this section, but they're thinking about it, is remember we talked about the fact that covenants also carry consequences. We talked about the, we talked here about the, the terms uh, of the terms of, of the covenant and, and so forth, but we don't really get to uh, in this section. We're, we're talking about what God wants, but uh, notice that we're not talking about the consequences. We'll get to that in another section, but they're they're thinking about it. We talk about the promises. Why would it be important to think about the the consequences of a covenant? And why we're why we spend so much time in session two uh, on this? God of the covenant you kind of have door number one, door number two. Yeah, exactly. Well, let, let me rephrase that. That's exactly right, Neil. But, uh, and let me go back to Noah's Ark, you know, since we were just there. Uh, it's pretty simple when you look at that massive ark to understand that there's one door. And it's easy to, to know whether you're inside or outside. You know that song, uh, one door and only one and yet its sides are two? Inside? And outside, on which side are you? This discussion in session two about covenants helps people to determine where they really are. And that's so important for our society today to contemplate, am I right with God or am I not right with God? And if they're not right with God, then it compels them to do something about it. Does that make sense? And so that's why this is so important, uh, section, uh, section two. Uh, we're not going to take the time today to actually rehearse this among ourselves, but how many of you think you could walk through this with someone? Raise your hand. I think it's really simple. I know it sounds uh, kind of complex, but, but it's not. When we begin to start thinking about uh, the Old Testament covenants and now the New Covenant, and we didn't talk about Jesus much because we're going to get to that in session three. But uh, what we do get to understand is that God's purpose in sending Jesus was to establish a covenant 
uh, with us. And that covenant was, was, was purchased by the, the blood of Christ. Any questions or uh, comments on session two? David? Yes. It's uh, important for, the, for people to realize that we're not under the old covenant, otherwise we would have to take all our vacations to Jerusalem. And <laughs> We'd be making pilgrimages to Jerusalem and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and it, that is that's a good good uh, uh, reminder that we are not under the old covenant, and that's why he talks about Jesus coming and bringing. Uh, basic Hebrews talks about it, a better covenant, a new covenant, uh, purchased through the blood, and that's why we don't uh, we're not saved by works. We're just traveling back to Jerusalem sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and so forth. Good. Any other comments? David? I think a lot of people that you talk to either know or have a good idea where they stand with God. But until they hear that, and, and it's confirmed when you talk to them, yes, that is where you stand with God. But the good thing is, is he wants you anyway. Yes. Because, you know, otherwise they're Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in this position, I, can't, I have no way out of it, so it repels. But when you find out that, yeah, that's where you are, but he wants you anyway, that's when it starts to change. Yeah, excellent. Roy? Something that's not clear to us and that would be ideal to us in America. We are a contractual society, not a covenant society. Right. Very little distinction. Right. Do you remember, yeah, Roy was talking about the fact that there's a difference between a contract and a covenant. And if you remember last week, you remember that John, in, in the first part, talks about the difference between contract and covenant. The difference being that contract is basically just what's best for you. You know, you sign a contract because... Like think of a prenuptial agreement. It's kind of like a contract. You're, you're signing that because you want to protect yourself. Uh, that's the difference. A uh, covenant is uh, something that uh, is uh, a blessing to both parties. You actually want the best for the other, for the other party. And that's why God sent His Son because He wants His best. And you think of a marriage covenant as a good example. Uh, nobody hopefully enters into marriage and just says, uh, it's all about me, right? Yeah, I hope, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, also I think the difference is that contract is based on this trust, whereas covenant is based on trusting the other person that they are going to follow through with their promise. Very good. Contracts are about basically not trusting. You have a contract because you don't trust that the other person's going to do uh, what they say they're going to do, and so you have legal ramifications if they don't. Whereas a covenant uh, trusts that both parties are going to live up to their end of the bargain. And with this session, too, you see how God fulfilled or kept his word through the Old Testament. And we trust that God will continue to do so uh, in the new covenant. And he did by sending Jesus to give his life for us. Yeah. On a contract, you break it, it's broken. And in a covenant, you just break the covenant of God. And you can't be restored to still. Good. It is not temporary, it is not terminating upon our default. We're the ones that are going to fall. Yeah, a uh, contract, that's good, Roy. Uh, with the contract, he said, uh, uh, when it's broken, it's broken, right? Um, but with the covenant, uh, with the covenant, if it's broken, it can be restored. And that's a good thing to share with people today, too, especially those who accepted Christ once and maybe have fallen away. Uh, they can be restored. There is restoration uh, in, in that covenant, with that covenant relationship. Okay, good stuff. Thank you.
All right, open up to page seven in your, in your um, syllabus. I just want to point you to this, and we're not going to take the time to read it this morning, but I would encourage all of you to uh, read this part of your homework this week, uh, The Parable of the Life-Saving Station. It's just a, a two, page, two pages, but it helps us to understand what our purpose and what our mission is uh, as Christ's ambassadors. I want us to all leave here uh, understanding that we have a ministry, and that's the ministry of what? Reconciliation. And God has called us to be His what? Ambassadors. And that sometimes the church forgets, maybe would be a, a good way to say that, forgets her mission. I know that I have individually. There have been times where I've forgotten what my mission is and uh, sometimes as a church we can forget what our purpose or what our mission is and uh, I think this helps us to understand uh, with this parable what our mission is as a church and then as we think about what our mission is as a church we can't help but think about what is my mission individually and what has God called me to do and to be and so we leave here understanding that each one of us are called to be his ambassadors and that that means we have an agenda when we go from here with every encounter that uh, we represent Jesus Christ uh, to those who may not know him and trust me when I say uh, this session two on covenants can be life transforming it really can be so I encourage you to uh, review session two again uh, in its entirety and, and really try to understand what, where, where this is coming from so that when we share it with others, uh, it really is life transforming. When we think about God's covenant, uh, God wants a covenant relationship uh, with us. Okay, uh, don't forget, your homework is, is more than a carpenter, chapters 5 and 6. Remember that Josh McDowell was an atheist. And he was an atheist all the way into his college years. And it was, this is really the story, his testimony, of how he came out of atheism and came to believe that Jesus Christ is the only answer. All right? And so, anyway, this is a, just a great book. I hope you're enjoying it. Chapters 5 and 6, it's easy reading. And then read pages 7 and 8, uh, The Life-Saving Station. Okay? And then uh, your other homework is to go out and have an agenda and be an ambassador. Can you do that? How many of you are going to do that this week? All right, praise the Lord. Good. All right, why don't we pray and then we're, we're going to call it quits today. Our Father and our God in heaven, we, uh, we pray that you would use each one of us this week to be your ambassadors, to be a light for you. Father, that you will uh, work through us as we realize that we have a divine calling, and that is to, to share Jesus Christ with those we meet. And so, Father, I pray that you would open doors of opportunity for each one of us that we might, uh, that we might share in this ministry of reconciliation, uh, reconciling men to you. Thank you for calling us to, to be that. Thank you for adopting us as your children. Thank you for that covenant that was established through Jesus Christ and his blood. Thank you for that love that motivated uh, that, that covenant. And so, Father, we thank you for all these blessings through Jesus Christ. Use us in a mighty way to build your kingdom. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks a lot for being here. Welcome.